My name is Brian Lee and I'm an instructor with Ultra Electronics Forensic Technology. I've been with the company since 2006 and I'm based in the European office in Dublin, Ireland, but a lot of my time is spent at international client sites providing user training on IBIS. Today I'm at Forensic Technology offices in Montreal, Quebec, where I'm joined by Marketing Manager Sabrina Benzid, who is hosting the webinar. Our webinar today is being attended by over 100 people around the world and you're all very welcome and thank you for attending in such large numbers. As we go through the webinar, feel free to ask any questions that you have in the chat box as you think of them. These messages are visible only to us here hosting the webinar, so you don't need to worry about your name being broadcast and seen by other attendees. At the end, I'll do my best to answer your questions if time allows. The plan is that the webinar will last approximately 50 minutes. Also, it is being recorded and will be made available online and also on the e-learning platform for those of you who are unable to join us live today or for you to revisit if you'd like. So what's on the agenda today is basically Brass Tracks best practices. We're going to recap some of the basics of Brass Tracks and take a look at some of the practices that can help efficiently build a database of high quality. First, we'll cover the data entry that takes place before the cartridge case is physically entered into brass tracks. After that, we'll quickly review how, holding, how loading the cartridge case into the holder can save us some time when it comes to image acquisition. Then we'll take a look at the guidelines for acquiring images of ejector marks before moving on to the other center fire regions of interest. At that point, we'll switch over to a live brass track session to walk through a validation of the complete set of acquired images, as well as taking a look at how to handle some slightly different scenarios, such as primer flowback and Glock type firing pins. We'll briefly go over the positioning protocols for the two, type of, two types of rimfire cartridge cases and conclude by reminding ourselves of the e-learning platform. So a lot to cover there. Most of it should be familiar to most of you, but I hope you'll all be able to take back a few points to your labs to get more out of brass tracks. It's also a good opportunity to ask any questions about brass tracks that you've always wanted to ask. Okay, so just before we begin for real, I'd like to ask a quick question about how long you've been using brass tracks, either the older heritage version, which was called Brass Catcher, or the original brass tracks, right up to the new HD 3D version. So basically the question is how much experience do you have with IBIS for cartridge cases? We're going to put a question up on screen for you to select the answer that's appropriate and click the submit button in the bottom of the question window. I'll mute my microphone for 30 seconds or so to allow all the answers to come in. Okay, thanks for all your responses. It seems like there's a good spread of experience across all the attendees. Uh, one in 10 are new users, uh, but the majority of you have been using uh, Brass Tracks or Brass Catcher for more than one year. Some of you have been using it for more than five years. One third of the attendees have been using it for more than five years. But still, let's hope you get something from today. Okay, so the first topic up is case and exhibit information or the data entry that we do before acquiring images of the cartridge case. The importance of this cannot be overstated as to enter incorrect information can result in the exhibit in question correlating against a wrong subset of your database. We'll see how using standard operating procedures can help with data entry before looking at the critical fields for cases and exhibits. We'll see how case event types and exhibit categories relate to each other and also how preferred list management can be used to clean up our drop-down menus. Now your lab may already be using standard operating procedures, and if so, that's great. If not, it's a good idea to put some in place surrounding the various aspects of your IBIS operation. Things like the naming format of cases and exhibits are very simple examples of where all users should use the same convention. Even if there are just a few brass tracks users in the lab, it's better if there is consistency between all of them. Having a document like the one pictured that sits next to the brass tracks acquisition station means that if someone hasn't used the brass tracks in a while, they can just step through the document and the integrity of the data being entered is still good. 
If everyone is using the same format, it makes it easier to spot errors on the match point. It can also make correlation requests easier to interpret if things like the year, the codes representing crimes or regions are included in the case R exhibit number. And basically, it just saves time if you have a format that you use for your um, case and exhibit uh, data entry. It's also really helpful to have a worksheet that contains all the IBIS relevant data on one page. This allows users to enter data quickly and reduces the need to consult secondary sources such as a LIM system or case notes to create accurate cases and exhibits. I've seen some labs use these worksheets with diagrams of the cartridge case to be entered on them so they can indicate on the, uh, on the cartridge case where the ejector marks and extractor marks are. This is very useful if the acquisition technicians using brass tracks don't have a lot of firearms examination expertise. When it comes to actually completing the fields in the add case dialog box, we obviously want to be as accurate as possible and not put inaccurate information in anywhere, but there are two critical fields in particular when it comes to cases. The occurrence date is very important as it will determine what the exhibits within this case correlate against. You need to be aware of regional date format variations. So for example, if you use the month, the day and the year format, or if you use day, month, year format, you need to be aware that that has to be set up on your brass tracks PC. The event type, while not used for correlation, is also important as it will determine what exhibit categories we will have available when we add an exhibit. I'll speak about case event types and exhibit categories in just a minute, but first let's look at the add exhibit dialog box. Now again here, all information should be accurate, but the really critical fields are caliber, firing pin, shape and caliber, and category, excuse me. The caliber and firing pin shape are the class characteristics that will determine how this exhibit correlates within the database. So obviously a mistake here could cause us big problems down the road on match point. The category is also a correlation parameter and along with the occurrence state will influence what exhibits our reference is compared to. Now let's take a look at how the case event type that we select influences the exhibit categories that we can use. So here's the standard list of case event types that we have in our dropdown. The first section of them could be grouped together as crimes. Selecting one of these will give us three options for exhibit category created within the case. The crime evidence category is obviously for exhibits that were recovered from a crime scene. The crime test fire returned and crime test fire terminated are categories for exhibits that were test fired from a firearm that was seized in a crime context. Whether returned or terminated is selected will depend on whether the firearm is to re-enter circulation or is to be put beyond use. Now the non-crime case event type opens up possibilities for firearm registration categories. Within a non-crime case, exhibit categories can be selected for civilian, police, military, or private security um, firearms that are newly registered or are being taken out of circulation. This non-crime option may not be available on your brass tracks, depending on your, car, on your configuration. Finally, the demo and quality control event types only allow exhibits to be created with these categories. The demonstration category is intended for when the brass tracks functionality is being presented, such as to visitors to your lab, and exhibits of this category do not correlate. Quality control exhibits correlate only with other quality control exhibits, and you'll see them when the forensic technology are doing service on your system. Okay, preferred list management. To speed up your data entry and reduce the risk of incorrect entries, you may wish to use the preferred list management tool. On the left here is the standard caliber list that comes on a brass tracks delivered from forensic technology. On the right is a more refined list of more commonly encountered calibers. Given that a large proportion of the workload at your lab could probably be covered by half a dozen calibers or so, it makes sense to trim these short lists down a little. I'll open up the brush tracks here on screen to show you how. If you go to the tools menu, 
you should see the preferred list section down here. Now, if it is grayed out, speak to your IBIS administrator who may have access to it. Once you open the tool, you'll have access to tweak all the shortlists. For example, if I go to the POE caliber codes here, on the right-hand side, I get my short list of calibers, and on the left-hand side, I get my longer extended list of calibers. Now, I can move uh, entries back and forth between these by selecting them and using the arrows. I can select multiple entries by using the control button as in a normal Windows application. Okay, let's look at loading the cartridge case in the holder. We'll see how the loading in the holder can make the uh, acquisition of our images more straightforward, and we'll also repeat the importance of cleaning the cartridge case exhibit. Okay, now the cartridge case holder has markings that can be used for quicker acquisition setup. These markings are in the form of dots that appear at the three o'clock position and at the six o'clock position. And we'll use them according to the regions of interest that are available on our exhibit. So if there is an ejector mark, we'll orient it towards the three dots. If there is no ejector mark, but there is a drag mark, we'll orient the drag mark towards the three dots. If there is neither an ejector mark nor a drag mark, but there is an extractor mark, we'll orient that extractor mark towards the six dots. Now, if there is none of the above, so no ejector mark, no drag mark, or no extractor mark, we'll orient the cartridge case however we please, because it is possible to change that orientation during the acquisition. Now, cleaning the cartridge case. We should always clean the cartridge case with a cotton tip dipped in acetone, but we need to be careful that no cotton fibers snag on the primer and interfere with our images. Finally, we set the height of the cartridge case by turning the holder upside down on a clean, flat surface by ensuring that the cartridge case is flush with the top of the holder. And now we're ready to start capturing images. So we'll take a look first of all at ejector marks, at positioning them, at tracing around them and the one centimeter gap. And then we'll take a look at how we need to be careful with the three o'clock light and how sometimes adjusting it can result in a much better quality image. Okay, so to position the ejector mark for image acquisition, if the cartridge case is correctly orientated, we simply need to move to the right hand side. So we can see in this example, Oh, excuse me. In this example, the cartridge case's ejector mark was located at the three dots. So by moving over to the right hand edge of the cartridge case, we see the ejector mark is here waiting for us. Now on our ejector mark, we see we have two lines. We have a vertical line and a horizontal line. It's better to treat them as two separate operations. So firstly, for the vertical line, it helps almost to forget the ejector mark. And using translation controls only, which are up, down, left, and right, basically maneuver the cartridge case so that the vertical red line is intersecting the rim of the cartridge case at the top and bottom of the field of view. Now, this is often easier to achieve if you change the light from the six o'clock to the ring light. So you can see in the video here, the ring light has been selected and it gives a much cleaner um, edge to the cartridge case, which we can use. So that's the first step, that's the vertical line. Now for the horizontal line, we're only going to use the rotation controls here. Now the rotation controls are the yellow buttons in the center of the compass, the red marker around the edge of the compass, or we can simply use the scroll wheel on the mouse. Now, as you see in the video here, we're just going to rotate it so that the horizontal line bisects the mark, basically so that there is as much of the mark above the horizontal line as there is below the line. Now, it's not important where the lines intersect, and that's a common misconception. It really doesn't need to be in the middle of the ejector mark, or it actually doesn't have to be within the ejector mark at all. So splitting it into two separate activities or two separate operations is a good idea. 
Now, how do we handle ejector marks that fall outside the field of view? If we stayed on the cartridge case rim, we wouldn't see them at all. Maybe we wouldn't see more, all of the mark or any of it. Now, this can happen with larger calibers or sometimes with Glock when the ejector mark can strike close to or even on the primer, such as the one on screen here where you can see that the ejector mark kind of falls between the primer and the head stamp in that little valley there. So in an example like this, where the field of view is not going to capture the ejector mark for us, what we will do is we'll set the vertical line as normal out on the rim of the cartridge case, and then we'll move the camera to the left so that the right-hand edge of the ejector mark is touching the vertical red line. So that's how we would handle something like that. All right, for any ejector mark, once the position it's set, is set, whether it's at the rim of the cartridge case or closer to the primer, we're ready to trace the outline of the impression. Now, you'll no doubt be familiar at the way we trace a blue line approximately one centimeter or 120 microns from the impression where possible. But what is the justification for this? Now, the reason we leave this one centimeter gap is that the algorithm works best when it can see the contour of the ejector mark or in other words, when you can see the transition from the head stamp to the impression. Obviously, it isn't always possible to leave the one centimeter gap when we have head stamp lettering interfering with the mark. And at the edge of the cartridge case, it doesn't make any sense to leave a gap as there is no transition to be seen. So here we trace tight to the edge. Okay. A common issue that we come across is while the 6 o'clock ejector mark images are correctly captured, the 3 o'clock images are either too dark or too bright. Now, while the lighting is automatic, we can help brass tracks by providing it with an appropriate starting light level. If you can consider the three points in the ejector mark acquisition process where our input as users is required, it's basically when we set the cartridge case position, when we trace the outline with 6 o'clock light, and then when we verify the outline with three o'clock light. Now it's this three o'clock light, as you can see in this example, that sometimes is too dark or too bright, depending on how the light shone on it. So what we want to do in this example is ensure that when we verify the outline at the three o'clock light, the light is in the right ballpark. So if we visualize the light scale from zero to 100%, what's actually happening is the brass tracks has an initial light level. And it might be some way short of what an optimal light level for this ejector mark is. Now, while the automatic light will try to find the best light level, it will only search in a range that is around that initial light level. And it might settle with a higher light, but it still could be a good distance short of what would be considered optimal for this ejector mark. So to make sure that it's in the right ballpark, or basically that it's pretty close to being accurate, we just need to make sure that before we press continue, that the illumination that we get on our ejector mark is appropriate. So you can see in the example in the video here, the detail within that ejector mark is very dark. And by increasing the light here by about 10, 12%, it gives us a much better uh, image that is illuminated the impressed marks within this ejector mark. And then by pressing continue, the automatic best light procedure will run and will give us a much better final image from the three o'clock ejector. Okay, moving through the acquisition process to capture images in the other regions of interest, such as the breech face and firing pin, we'll take a look at the orientation before asking how to orient a cartridge case that has no distinguishing marks, a question we get asked quite a lot. So the point where we see the breech face ring light image and the prompt for us to verify the cartridge case position is our cue to consult the poster that I'm sure you all have a copy of in your labs. We start by be we begin by asking, is there a drag mark? Now, if there is a drag mark, we put it to the east or to the three o'clock position. If we don't have a drag mark, we'll position the ejector mark in the northern hemisphere and the extractor mark in the southern hemisphere. From here, we move on to the breech face pattern left on the primer. If we have a granular, smooth, or circular pattern, we don't need to take any additional action. But if we have parallel lines, arches, or a crosshatch pattern, we need to orient according to the protocol. 
Now the protocol here is if you have parallel lines, you orient the cartridge case so that those lines appear horizontally. If you have arches, they peak upwards or open downwards. And if you have cross-hatch lines, they intersect diagonally. After this, all that's necessary is to center the primer and proceed with the acquisition, which we do by pressing continue. From here, it takes between three and four minutes to complete the acquisition. Okay, so just a quick word on manufacturing marks, such as the pre-striated primer that we see in this example. Now, these marks are obviously on the primer before the round is fired, and they're going to contaminate any marks left by the breech block of the firearm, and it's going to confuse the IBIS system a little. So once fired, the marks will appear like this on brass tracks. In general, if the lines continue into the firing pin, it means that they were present before firing, and we want to try and find anything else on the cartridge case rather than these lines to orient. When it comes to test firing, this type of scenario can be guarded against by ammunition selection protocols, but in the event of crime evidence of this type being recovered, it's worth bearing in mind that we would ideally use some other marks to orient this cartridge case. Okay, so from a cartridge case with lots of marks to one with very few. How to orient a cartridge case with no ejector, no visible extractor, no drag marks, or no breech face marks? A 357 Magnum or a 38 from a revolver, for example, or a 12 gauge as shown here. In the absence of any marks that will help us orient the cartridge case according to the IBIS protocols, what do we do? The answer here is that it depends on your lab protocol. There are no forensic technology recommended protocols for this. I'm aware that some labs, in the event of an eccentric firing pin strike, they will orient the thin edge of the primer to the bottom. In other countries, I've seen the narrow edge of the cartridge case primer be oriented to the right-hand side. It's very much lab-specific. The good news from an IBIS point of view is that the only correlation score affected by the variation here is the breech face side light. And as long as everyone in the jurisdiction is doing the same thing, there's nothing to worry about. Okay, now we'll move away from pre preparing and positioning the exhibit for image acquisition and on to validating the acquired images. We'll ask why we should validate and how long we should spend doing it. And then we have a live brass track session validating a few different types of cartridge case acquisitions. Before that, however, I'd like to ask you another poll question. So the poll question is, in your experience, how often do your brass tracks acquisitions require correction at the validation stage? Now this might either be a slight outline adjustment or a reacquisition because the light or the focus was no good. So I'll mute my microphone for again 30 seconds or so to give you a chance to reply. Okay, so looking at the results there, it does look like there's a really large spread between um, the attendees here today like one in five of you pretty much selected every every one of those options. Some people are acquiring all, are, are changing the acquired images at validation stage for almost every exhibit, but at the same time over a quarter of you are never really changing it. It's, a, it's an interesting topic, so we'll get into it now. Okay, so why do we validate and how long does it take? Okay, so the, the validation is an opportunity for us to quality check the images that the brass tracks has automatically acquired. The lighting, the focus, and the outlines have been set by the brass tracks. And if you think about it, we really haven't had our hands on the brass tracks since we set the breech face ring light position. Now, it's a kind of a two-way street here. In my experience, experienced users, so users who've been using the brass tracks for a long time, they become extremely trusting of IBIS, and sometimes they don't even look at the images, they just save and close. And on the other hand, new users feel like they want to intervene, and they want to change things, and they want to modify rings, and they want to you know, alter things slightly and put their own signature on them. Now, the medium should be somewhere in the middle, and in general, it should only take about 15 to 20 seconds to validate a cartridge case acquisition. Right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go over to the brass tracks, and we'll do a live uh, validation 
of a cartridge case. So the first thing to note here is that I'm using version 3.1 service pack one and there's a couple of new touches here which might be but might not be familiar to those of you who use the brass tracks that's of an earlier version. Um, I'm going to go through all nine of these images which is a standard suite of brass tracks images for a center fire cartridge case with an ejector mark. Now you'll notice that there is a kind of a red mask around the blue ring and inside the red ring here for my breech face ring light. That's basically a mask that is applied to kind of emphasize what's being excluded from your region of interest at this particular area. With the breech face ring light, we have two rings. We've got a blue ring and a red ring. Now, the blue ring should be on the outer edge of the primer, always, regardless of whether or not there is any washout. We should always respect the outer diameter of that primer. The red ring should be around the firing pin, but it should be positioned outside any washout that is present. So it's basically this donut of information between the red and the blue ring that tells us what we're going to be considering for the breech face ring light area, region of interest. We also want to check that the focus is good and that the lighting is good. So we can see we have a nice sharp focus here and the lighting is appropriate. There's nothing washed out. It's, there's nothing too dark. So that's the breech face ring light. Breech face side light, we don't have any rings on this image and the focus is the same as the focus for the breech face ring light. So if it was good on the first image, we don't need to really verify it here. All we're doing with the breech face side light is checking that the light is good. Basically, there's nothing really blown out and saturated about this image. And that looks good here too. Now the third image in the top row is the breech face 3D. And this can be very helpful if there is any ambiguity about where the ring should be placed. If I go to the display tab here, and if I choose an image overlay that is say ring light, and I put a metallic composition like such as brass, then I can maneuver the 3D image underneath the light here, and I can see exactly where the breech face ends and the firing pin begins, and see if I did a good job of placing the rings. So that's the breech face 3D image. Moving on to the second row of images to our firing pin. Now this is another new feature of version 3.1 service pack one. The firing pin circle is now changed to a blue color. Basically that's to maintain consistency between all of the outline colors. So what's inside a blue ring is included. What's inside a red ring is excluded. Now with the firing pin, obviously we're only interested in the area that is inside this blue um, circle. We want to make sure that the firing pin here has good focus and has an appropriate light level and we want to make sure that this ring is centered on the firing pin and is also as wide as possible without including any of this washout or breech face information. The 3D image is kind of works in the same way as the breech face one did previously. If we put an image overlay of ring light and again a metallic composition on it, we can really see in 3D where that ring falls and if it's if it's in a good position or if it needs to be altered slightly. The final image in the second row there is the full head stamp. Now that helps with orientation, just to check to make sure everything is in the right position. So you're expecting to see your ejector mark here in the northern hemisphere, and it just kind of gives you an overall image of the, the entire cartridge case. Moving on to the bottom line, the ejector mark line. The first image we come across is the six o'clock side light, where again, we're checking here the focus and the lighting that the machine um, provided for this image. If we do want to make any final changes to the outlines, we can do it here. The three o'clock side light image, this is the one that we spoke about earlier that has a tendency to be too dark or too bright. If we didn't pay attention to when we were verifying the outline that the light was good, and here it looks okay. And again, the same thing with the 3D. The 3D, if we place an image overlay on it, and again, put a metallic composition, I used light copper this time just for a change. If we rotate this around and even increase the 3D elevation just to exaggerate it slightly, we can see if we're including anything that we should be or if we're excluding anything that we shouldn't be. And that's basically the complete set of images. So in general, I think for most acquisitions, if you look at your breech face ring light, your breech face side light, 
your firing pin ring light, and your two ejector mark images in 2D. Once you check them, and once they're okay, that's pretty much all you need to do. If there is any ambiguity, then maybe you need to have a look at your 3D images. So that's why I say 15, 20 seconds should usually be enough. It's about three seconds per image when you're, when you're doing your validation. Okay, so now let's take a look at some slightly unusual but not uncommon validation scenarios that we may be presented with. Okay, so we'll take a look first of all at flowback. So flowback is where a primer material has entered the firing pin aperture, and we basically get this raised area on the primer that kind of falls on the breech face. Now we have got um, basically guidelines for the placement of these outlines, but I'm just gonna go back over to the brass tracks there and load an exhibit so we can do a live kind of validation. Okay, so the blue circle, the blue ring, should always be on the outer edge of the primer. And the red circle should be placed around the firing pin circle, around the firing pin impression, excuse me, and outside any of that washout. So that aperture mark, that flowback pattern basically there, we want to include that in our donut of information. If I look at it under the 3D, we can see here, by putting the overlay and composition on it, turning it on its side, and we can increase the elevation so we can see that area exaggerated. That area there that's standing proud of the primer surface, that is useful information because it's firearm specific. So that's how we would do a breech face uh, validation for flowback. For firing pin, it's basically exactly the same. Your blue ring or your red ring, if you're using an earlier version of the software, should be centered on the firing pin and should be as wide as possible without including any of that washed out information. Okay, so that's flowback. Moving on to rectangular. So this would be very common in some areas, um, such as SWD. And again, we have guidelines for the, um, the placement of our outlines here. I'll just move back over to the brass tracks. And we'll go through one of these. Now again, same thing, the blue circle should be on the outer edge of the primer. And the red circle, it's a little bit different here because you have a rectangular firing pin impression, but you have a circular outline. And what you want to do here is basically center it on the firing pin impression and place it on the outer edge of that washout prone area. So that area there where you tend to get washout. It's not gonna be perfect. You're gonna be excluding some information there but you have to do the best you can to try and, uh, and delimit that, that uh, washout. For the firing pin then, our firing pin circle, we want it to be centered. Now that's very important that it's centered on this white spot here, which represents the floor of the firing pin impression. And when it's centered on that, we expand it so that it includes the four corners of the impression like that. So we're going to be excluding or including some information that is a little bit out of focus, but the policy here is to try and include that rectangular impression within this um, outline. That's basically how you do a rectangular. So moving back over to the presentation here, we're going to talk about Glock. Now there is a much more detailed document in the works that will describe the outline placement for many different kinds of Glock, but for today I'm going to deal with just two, those with and without aperture flowback. So first of all, without aperture flowback, so basically something that looks a little like this. <clears throat> there again are our guidelines for outline placement, but I'm just going to go over to the brass tracks and take a look. So here would be a standard Glock without aperture flowback. So what we do here is the blue ring as normal goes on the outer edge of the primer. The red ring, the red circle, is centered on the firing pin impression and it's expanded to be on the outer edge of the washout prone area. So you see just up to the edge of that shear mark there. And again, this is where the 3D is very helpful. If I put the ring light overlay and a metallic composition on here, you can see exactly where that red ring is falling. It's just at the edge of the shear mark before the firing pin impression. For the firing pin itself, 
what we want to do with our ring is center it again on the floor of the impression. So we center it on that white, bright spot there. And we expand the ring so that the four corners here are included inside that ring. So it's quite similar to the rectangular. So that's how you'd handle a straightforward Glock without aperture flowback. Now to look at the other example of a Glock, this time with aperture flowback. By this I mean that the shear mark is kind of almost folded over the firing pin impression a little. And it's got some really useful information here, but it means that we're going to have to be a little bit uh, different with our outline placement. So if I go and look at an example here where we have some aperture flowback, you can see if I look under the 3D here, I'm going to put the metallic composition on it again and turn it on its side. So we can see that the shear mark here kind of comes in a little bit and intrudes a little bit on the firing pin impression. Now that we want to include in our breach face area. We want to include that in the donut of information that is going to be correlated as our breach face. And in order to do that, what we do is, well, our blue circle goes on the outer edge of the primer as usual. And the red circle is centered on the firing pin as per normal but it is put inside any of those distinctive markings. So these distinctive markings that I have here between six and nine o'clock, they are what I want to include in the donut. Now I am going to be including some not so useful information over here from the drag mark and even up here, which didn't really have much to do with the, the breach face, but for where there is aperture flowback, we want to do our best to try and include as much of that shear mark as we can. For the firing pin, it's basically the same as previously, but what we want to do here is center it on the white spot, the basically the floor of the impression, and we expand it to try and include the four corners of the mark, just like that. The important thing is that it's centered on that white area there. And then we save and close that. Okay, <clears throat> so that's an example of how you validate a cartridge case along with a few examples of some of the slightly different ones, some of the exceptions such as flowback, rectangular, and glocks. And like I say, watch this space for the, um, for the glock uh, document which will be on the way soon. Okay, let's briefly recap rimfire cartridge cases. We look at rimfire rectangular and rimfire circular positioning protocols. With rimfire rectangular, we have our two red lines back, but this time, as well as the vertical line being offset, the horizontal line is also, is also offset. This is our prompt to position the firing pin impression in the bottom left-hand quadrant with the top edge of the impression parallel to the horizontal red line and with the right-hand point of the firing pin impression touching the vertical red line. For the circular, it's very similar to an ejector mark in that we position the, uh, it, the cartridge case so that the vertical red line is intersecting the rim of the cartridge case at the top and bottom of the field of view using translation. And then we rotate the cartridge case so that the horizontal line bisects that firing pin impression. And again here, a common misconception is that the intersection point of these two lines should be in the middle of the firing pin impression. That's not the case. It doesn't have to be in the center. It doesn't even need to be near it. So we trace our outlines very similar to the ejector marks. With the rimfire rectangular, we take two images of the firing pin impression, one with six o'clock lighting, one with three o'clock lighting. And for circular rimfire, it's just one image of the firing pin with ring light. We want to leave that one centimeter gap where possible, and we want to avoid the head stamp lettering. Okay, I'd like to finish by speaking about the e-learning platform that has been available for the last year or so. So let's start with a quick poll. So I'd like to know, have any of you ever accessed any training material on the IBIS Trax HD 3D e-learning platform? Now that could be training guides, it could be any of our technical documents, or it could be some of the interactive e-learning content. Um, I'm going to mute my microphone while the question goes up there. 
Okay, so it looks like a 65-35 split between people who have not and people who have accessed the e-learning platform. So some have, some haven't. All right, so we're going to talk about how to log on to the e-learning site, and we're going to take a quick tour of some of the content before looking at the material that will be made available soon. So your account. Now, first thing to say here is that the material is available in English and Spanish. Now, you will have received an email um, some time ago with your username and password and a link to the uh, to the e-learning site. Um, if you can't uh, if you can't find that email or if you never received an email, contact us. The contact information will be um, at the end of this webinar. Now, what I'll do is I'll jump over to a live session of the e-learning platform just to show you what it looks like. So I'm just going to use a demo account for the purposes of today. And I log in here and I can see all the courses that are available at the moment. So you can see they're divided by machine. We have introduction to IBIS tracks HD 3D, which is like an overall kind of view of the IBIS system and how the various components interact with each other. And there are then more specific um, modules related to, for example, an introduction to brass tracks. Now, the idea of this module is that it would be something taken by users in a lab before the instructor comes to give the, the training. So, when a fire, the process Okay, so there's an example of just some of the um, some of the content that's on here for the introduction to brass tracks um, module. Uh, it basically steps through the basics and gives a kind of a, a kind of a rudimentary understanding of the system to users, so they're not starting from scratch when the instructor uh, gets the site, so that they'll be able to hit the ground running. So if we go back again to the menu, you'll see for bullet tracks, there is a what's new package for version 3.0. Uh, there's also a video showing how to mount a damaged bullet for the acquisition of a single land engraved area. For match point, there is another what's new module there. There is the webinar that was delivered last year on cartridge case review functions, as well as a technical note for uh, rank sort. Um, if I just move over to the far right here, if you look at the library, you'll see that for English and Spanish, that's version 3.0 as an example, all of the release notes, training guides, user guides, administration guides, all the PDFs and all of the basically soft copies of the material that you need is also available on the e-learning platform. And you can always be sure it's going to be the most up-to-date. So even if you have a system that's a few years old and you don't have the most um, up-to-date material, you'll find it here on the e-learning platform. So just to go back and look at what's coming. The upcoming content, is there is an introduction to Matchpoint module which is in the works at the moment and it should be ready in the next few months. As I mentioned previously, there is a more comprehensive document on Glock guidelines which will be also um, shared on our website but also on the e-learning platform. A version of the new Brasstrax image acquisition protocol poster will be put up there soon. It's going through its kind of final set of reviews at the moment. And also, of course, this webinar will be available up there too. So like I say, if you haven't got a login or if you can't find the email or you can't remember your password, contact us and we'll get you set up back on there as soon as possible. Okay, so just to briefly summarize what we covered today, we started with the standard operating procedures, our SOPs, and we saw that they can help maintain data integrity in our IBIS systems. We then took a look at case and exhibit information and the important fields there. We looked at mounting and loading a cartridge case uh, into the cartridge case holder before going on to position our um, cartridge cases and acquire images of the ejector marks. We briefly looked at the center fire regions of interest and how we orient them before spending a little bit of time on validation of a standard center fire acquisition, but also on some of those more challenging ones such as flowback, lock, etc. We briefly recapped the rimfire protocols 
and we finished up by having a quick tour of the e-learning platform. So that's basically what we covered today. Um, now for now, I'd just like to thank you very much for your attention. Um, invite you please to take a few minutes to complete the follow-up survey that's going to be here um, following this uh, webinar. Keep an eye on your inbox, our website, and um, our social media outlets for details on how to access the recording of this webinar. Stay tuned for future training dates and topics. In fact, the, this webinar is going to be delivered in Spanish uh, two weeks from today on the 28th of June, so any Spanish speakers in your lab may be interested in that. Don't forget about the online online training platform, so the e-learning basically, to, you contact us with uh, any queries if you, if you don't have access, if you don't have a login or if you can't remember your login, you contact us at training at ultra-ft.com and if you have any marketing queries, it's sabrina.benzid at ultraft.com. So basically any queries you have about the e-learning or anything else for that matter, just training at ultraft.com. Okay, so this is just a final reminder that the fourth Interpol Firearm Forensic Symposium is, um, is going to take place this year in Dubrovnik, Croatia, between the 17th and the 19th of October. The theme this year is Crime Gun Intelligence, focused on results, and we hope to see as many of you as possible there. Um, the registration is now open, so register now or get more information at www dot iffs 2017.com so that's it thanks very much and have a great rest of your day